Hello everyone and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History for an episode of Fave Film Fashion with me, fashion historian and Joan and Betty fanatic, Amanda Halle. And in this episode, we got rats in the cellar because we're going to be looking at Norma Koch's Oscar-winning costumes for Robert Aldridge's cult classic, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. But you are, Blanche. You are. The idea for this episode actually comes courtesy of my husband. Last week, I did an episode of That Dress on Edith Head for Betty Davis in All About Eve, and an episode of That Dress on Adrian for Joan Crawford. And I'll leave the links to both of those in the description area of this episode in case you didn't catch them. Anyway, Rupert, my husband, said, You've done, Betty. You've done, Joan. Why don't you make it a perfect trifecta and do them both in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which has such brilliant costumes, and it's also one of my favourite movies. I thought this was a great idea. Before we start, just to remind you that I don't do comments here, but head over to the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group to comment, chat, and have some company. Anyway, before we kick in, I want to just issue a little caveat on this episode. I'm not going to talk about the famous feud. Instead, I recommend watching Feud, as if you haven't already seen it a million times. And I'll just say for my part that I think the real problem between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford was simply that they were very different people. And I think that this picture speaks very directly to what very different kind of people they were. And I'm not going to talk about whether or not Joan wore falsies in this movie. She probably did, but they in no way detracted from her sterling and very moving performance in the film. Right, let's talk about whatever happened to Baby Jane. The film might read like a bit of a camp classic today, but in its time it was taken very seriously, gaining, I think, five Oscar nominations, including Betty Davis for Best Actress. The Academy awarded it one, and that was for Norma Koch's costumes in the black and white category. And there is Norma with her Oscar. And here's Norma with Robert Aldridge and Joan, probably a publicity still for Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, judging by the costume sketch Norma is holding. And can we please just look at the expression on Joan's face? Always the star. Anyway, Norma Koch was really a genre designer, meaning that she worked primarily in genre pictures like westerns or sci-fi movies. But under the advice of Bing Crosby, she worked freelance rather than being assigned to one specific studio, which gave her more leeway. She received three Oscar nominations in her career. Her win for Baby Jane, then again in 1964 for Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, and then in 1972 for her costumes for the Diana Ross vehicle, Lady Sings the Blues. Right, on to her work in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which really was superb, because she understood from the get-go that Whatever Happened to Baby Jane was a movie that focused on contrasts both metaphorically and visually. The contrast between Jane and Blanche, between blonde and brunette, between young and old, between the incredibly dark interior of the Hudson House and the bright, almost dazzling Californian exterior shots, between the fussy, fusty, dusty, dark and over-cluttered home of the Hudson sisters and the clean, bright, mid-century modern home of their neighbours next door. So of its time was this home that there is even a Margaret Keane Big Eye print on the wall. This Margaret Keane Big Eye print. And Norma used palette for contrast as well. Although movie baddies traditionally wore black and good guys wore white, she puts Blanche in dark colours, whereas Jane is costumed in very light hues. And this is psychologically very clever. Blanche is costumed in the same palette as the house. She has become part of the house because she's a prisoner there, whereas Jane is out and about. She's still part of the outside world. 
Also, in such dark interiors, whenever we see Jane with her light wardrobe, white face and blonde hair, the visual brightness of her presence is creepy, sinister, ghoulish, almost ghost-like within the darkly lit settings. Right, let's take Jane and Blanche one by one and discuss how Norma helped build their characters with costume. Let's start with Blanche. Here's the original costume sketch for her first scene, and here's Joan's costume test, and of course, she had to be sitting for all of her wardrobe tests to ascertain how everything would look in a wheelchair. And here is Miss Crawford in the actual scene. Now, what I find interesting is that this frilly jacquard housecoat looks incredibly old-fashioned, given the era of the early 1960s. And as Blanche is sane, why isn't she wearing something more contemporary, such as this fabulous housecoat that Joan wore in Torch Song? Well, it wouldn't have worked, would it? For a movie set in the Hollywood Hills, Baby Jane is very Southern Gothic, isn't it? Both in narrative and visual design. And this is sort of interesting. Because the next movie Betty and Joan were supposed to make together was Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, and that was Southern Gothic. So putting Blanche in more contemporary attire would have been jarring, and as I mentioned before, Blanche was imprisoned in the house, essentially becoming part of it. Yet, unlike the cluttered, antique house, Norma's tailoring for Blanche is very sharp and very structured, which contrasts nicely with her wardrobe for Jane, which was all drapey or sloppy or frou-frou. So by use of palette and tailoring, Norma Koch uses costume to show contrast, again, between the two sisters. Not only in terms of their taste, but in terms of their psychology. Yet, obviously, the main event, wardrobe-wise, comes by way of of Norma Koch's costumes for Jane Hudson, which I honestly think are truly brilliant and inspired. Jane Hudson wasn't just lost to time, sartorially she was lost in time. Absolutely nothing she wears is from the early 1960s, her wardrobe jumping through earlier decades when Jane was either a starlet or a child, like here for example. Now I actually think that this is a beautiful dress. But it's a beautiful 1930s dress with its fluttering bell sleeves and draped neckline. It's not unlike this dress from a 1930s pattern book. And that soft leafy print and all that fluttery bias cut is obviously meant to suggest that this dress comes from the 1930s and that Jane has held on to it from the time when she was a young and pretty starlet, yet she's still slopping around in it. And take a look at this dress from the 1930s. Throw a dishcloth over the shoulder and add a pair of backless bathroom slippers, and it would have worked perfectly for these scenes. Now, I've heard it said that the character of Jane Hudson dresses as a child, but she actually doesn't, apart from when she's donning her comeback costume, which we'll look at in a second. Another piece of quintessential Jane wardrobe is this dress. And here's Betty's costume test. And here is Betty wearing it in the scene. Again, Jane has time warped to the 1930s. Take a look at this dress from the Great Depression. All we have to do is add a raggedy velvet ribbon at the neck and a ton of beads. And it's essentially the same dress that Betty wears in the movie. So she's not dressed as a child, but as a woman in her own deranged time warp. Again, lost both to time and lost in time, Jane's dolled up out and about outfit draws from the past. Here's the original costume sketch. I love it. It is signed Norma Koch. And then in the bottom left, it says, OK, Aldridge. Clearly, he had approved this costume. Here is Betty wearing the dress in the movie. And here's a close up of that fabulous beret embellished with rhinestone brooches. And here's the back. And you can see that Jane hasn't spared the horses when it comes to flashy rhinestone brooches and hair clips. This time, however, Jane's jumped back to the 1940s, 
her dress replicating perfectly the popular utility shirt dress of the war years, her beret another 40 staple. And again, it's all about contrasts. Norma puts the Hudson sister's neighbor, Mrs. Bates, in a staggeringly stylish mid-century outfit here, with capris, a Vera Newman-style tunic and a broad sun hat, so that in the subsequent scene, when confronted by Jane, you get these two sharply contrasting silhouettes, one sleek, stylish and contemporary, the other an anachronistic mess, and the contrasts in the scene don't just end in costume. You get a peek at the neighbor's car, which is modern with its shark fin features, so utterly of its era, and you also see the Hudson car, this old Lincoln convertible. Also, Mrs. Bates's garage is all big mid-century panels and windows, whereas Jane's is in the Mediterranean revival style so popular in the earlier decade of the century. It's almost as if you can draw a line down this scene to separate the past from the present and the sane from the utterly demented. And yet another fashion era is drawn upon for Jane's rather pretty peignoir set. Here's the original costume sketch. Here's Betty in the movie, and take a look at that flounced shawl feature, the lace sleeves with all of those layered flounces and all of the embellishment, and then take a look at this evening robe from the 1910s. It's essentially the same, right? It's almost as if Jane's peignoir may have belonged to her mother, packed up in a trunk in the attic and then discovered by Jane when rummaging for props for her comeback. It's actually quite lovely, but so out of time and so out of place for California in the early 1960s. But of course, Jane's most famous piece of wardrobe is her comeback costume. This Edwardian style little girl's dress that she's obviously had replicated from the dress that she wore when she was Baby Jane, star of vaudeville. Made of eyelet lace with a satin sash, three identical versions of this dress had to be made, at least three, because of course there are always duplicates of any screen costume. The one that Jane as an adult wears, which is an identical duplicate to the costume that the little girl who plays Jane as a child wears, but there was a third version, and I'm sure you can guess what I'm talking about. The baby Jane doll wears an identical replica of this dress as well. And it's actually rather lovely. If you look at all of the detail, look at the paneling on the front there. And if you zoom in, you can see that the eyelet lace actually is fashioned to look like little hearts. And hearts, you'll see, are actually a recurring motif in whatever happened to baby Jane. Of course, I have to speak to Betty's extraordinary hair and makeup in the movie. We all know that she designed it herself, but it was actually Joan's stylist, Peggy Shannon, who helped Betty achieve this very peculiar look. Betty said that she wanted to look like, quote, Mary Pickford in decay, end quote. And it was Peggy who suggested that she layer makeup on top of makeup on top of makeup. But by all accounts, Betty applied her own makeup for the movie, and I found this gif drawn from a behind-the-scenes featurette showing Betty applying that caked-on makeup on set. Peggy Shannon also contributed Joan's blonde wig. Digging around, the stylist found an old wig that Joan Crawford had worn in one of her musicals decades before, restyled it to give it those childlike ringlets, and voila, Jane was born. Robert Aldrich loved Betty's makeup. It was what he and the production team had wanted, but they were too afraid to ask Bet to appear so grotesque, unless she be offended. They should have remembered that our Betty was never shy of using makeup and wigs to appear less than attractive on film, and Jane was just another in a series of rather odd looks for the star, which she absolutely gloried in.
Critics of the time, including most notably Betty Davis, thought that Joan looked too glamorous in the role of a middle-aged crippled recluse. But personally, I think that's unfair. Certainly, she did wear makeup. But why wouldn't Blanche, a former movie star with self-esteem, wear a little makeup? Women of her generation didn't feel dressed unless they wore some maquillage. It was all part of appearing well-groomed. And in fairness to Joan, she had no issue looking less than glam in the movie's final scenes. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is a movie full of fun and subtle details. For example, in the Hudson living room, a room that Blanche can't access from her confinement on the second floor, every single picture in the room is of Jane, either a child vaudevillian or a 30 starlet. There is, however, one large picture frame with nothing in it, apart from a corner of a photo that's obviously been ripped in rage from the frame. The suggestion, of course, being that this was a photograph of Blanche in her heyday, and there was no way that Jane was having that. And one of my favorite details comes by way of makeup. The little heart that Jane paints on her cheek before heading into town, an almost direct reference to Clara Bow. And another time we see hearts appearing, rather subtly and without comment, in whatever happened to baby Jane. Certainly, hearts are girly and flirty and coquettish, everything that Jane believes she is. But I think they also speak to the heartbreak of this story. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Fave Film Fashion here on The Ultimate Fashion History. Join our Facebook group. We're always ice cream dancing over there. If you want to contact me directly, you don't have to throw a scrunched up message from a window. Just email me through my website, amandahalley.com. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe, like and share, because I'll be back very soon with more on the ultimate fashion history. So until then, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Thank you.